Welcome to the Strategy with Jason podcast. Tune in for everything you need to know to stay in the know regarding the automotive industry. Here's your host, Jason Harris. Hey, 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 what's going on, Podcast Nation? It is Jason Harris here, and thank you for joining me on another episode of Strategy with Jason. Today, I have a very special guest. It's her second time back, and I'm so excited to jam with her. I have the one, the only, the oh-so-famous Miss Melanie Broden in the house. Melanie, what's up? What's up? How you doing? <laughs> I'm doing good. <laughs> I'm on my second take for this, so this is this is a good one, right? Great. <laughs> hey, Melanie, Great thank you for taking the time to jam with me today, man. I'm really excited to uh, go over some of the topics that we've chosen. They're, they're very timely and there's going to be some great strategies. So if you're out there and you're watching, and you're listening to this, get the notebook out, get the pencil out, because Melanie's about to seriously drop some knowledge bombs on you. Um, before, before we get into our topics today, you know, I love starting off all these podcasts with a little origin story because I'm always fascinated by it. But how did you get started in this crazy little business we call the automotive industry? It's a great question. It's a question I'm asked <laughs> frequently. <laughs> So like many of us in the car business, it was an accident. <laughs> it was a complete accident. So I went to school for fashion, actually, jewelry design. And shortly after I graduated, I identified that I did not want to pursue jewelry design as my career choice, but I wanted to work. I had my real estate license in New York City, and I started marketing myself a lot as a real estate agent. And I realized that I loved marketing a lot, but I wanted to be able to afford to stay in New York. <laughs> so I started working for an advertising publisher and that evolved into me going to work for a tech company in the auto industry, previously known to some of you as BZ Results. I don't know if you remember mm -hmm. that company, mm -hmm. you said the websites that had the, yeah, you know, the dancing people and the music. It was like the MySpace of websites in the car business. <laughs> um, that was in 2009 and the rest is history. That's awesome. And we're glad that you accidentally fell into uh, this industry. But I find that's true, though. Well, look, look, either you're born in the industry you get conned into the in industry or you accidentally stumble your way into it. And I think some of the best people have stumbled their way <laughs> into the business. Yeah. So, well, look, we got some great marketing topics that we're going to jam about today. And I love the first one that you chose here is to talk about influencers because I still think the strategy behind influencers is one that dealerships just don't quite necessarily understand, uh, but can bring some real, real value. So, you know, let's, I'd love to get your thoughts. A, for everyone out there who's watching and listening, maybe first describe what an influencer is and how dealerships can engage with influencers to, you know, better their efforts. Absolutely. And, and the funny thing is, is that I am not the biggest fan of the, of the term influencer, but I've just come to accept the fact that I have to use it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, due to the fact that it's just, it is what it is. And so what an influencer to me means is someone who has a large following on social media and, and really is posting content to a specific audience or a demographic. Mm -hmm. And what I had noticed specifically in my role working as a VP of marketing in an auto group is that dealerships across the country and throughout Canada are just not leveraging relationships with influencers. Yeah, no. um, I think that depending on the brands that you have, you know, what your franchises are, um, what specific models you want to focus on, there are influencers that go within those specific segments that you could be connecting with. And those influencers can be in a various different platforms, right? So you have the Instagram influencers, you have the influencers who are on Twitter, you have the influencers on LinkedIn, you have the influencers on YouTube, and now we have the influencers that are on TikTok. And so I think from a dealership marketing perspective, it's a very efficient way to utilize your marketing dollars, and it's an easy ROI to show um, you know, anyone internally um, or externally you know, how you're able to pencil um, against utilizing an influencer. Yeah, you know what? I think a lot of dealerships, when they hear the word influencer, you know, they think of people that have 
millions and millions of followers, you know, and they're, they're, they're internationally known. And that's, that's not really necessarily the case. In fact, actually, I, I, I think, I think some of the, some of the biggest bang for our box as far as strategy goes is working with local micro influencers. And, but right. I think dealerships kind of struggle to identify how to work with them and what are the strategies to work with them. But I love the fact that you said audience, cause I think that's, that's where you got to start, right? right? Like a dealership really truly needs to understand who their target audience is and they will probably, they're going to have way more than one. Right. And right. then once they've truly defined that audience kind of reversing engineering backwards to find the influencer that is locally, or if they need nationally, nationally, um, that that kind of connects with that audience. Um, right. You know, can we, can you kind of give me an example of uh, like an audience and how a dealership can kind of reverse backwards to find an influencer that meets that audience? Yeah, absolutely. So one of the tools that I always use to leverage in my role in the marketing department um, was any of the pump in pump out reports that the factory would provide and any of the meetings that the factory would have as well. Mm -hmm. A lot of times they have the demographics information and they're sending that data out monthly. And so most general managers, most sales managers, most executives, dealer principals have a great understanding of who their customers are. And so my suggestion for any of those uh, management team members would be just look at the data from the factory and also look at your customer base and talk to your salespeople about who your customers are. And like I said, most stores understand who their customers are just based on who's buying their cars or who's coming in and servicing their cars, which sometimes could be two different types of people. But 100%. for the most part, you understand that. And then from there, I would start doing some location research on a site like Instagram, where you can search by location, uh, different people, and then you can hopefully identify, you know, a few different options of influencers that are in your market. And they could be, you know, for example, um, a female mom influencer. Yeah, that's a good one. Who you could loan a vehicle to that they could take and they can create content with and they can plug your store. Another way that you can leverage an influencer is inviting them to an event you know, doing a meet and greet. Um, another way that to leverage an influencer is to have them engage with your content, um, engaging me liking their content, commenting on your content, et cetera. And so those are some of the ways that I would really suggest looking at your, you know, PMA or private market area or AOI, whatever, you know, your factory <laughs> is calling it um, to really identify who those customers are and then work backwards that way. No, I, I like that. And I, I think that's a, that's a great place to, to start with the data that we already have. You know, um, but I, I think uh, another really good idea, I think I've seen this, I've done this actually now with a couple of dealerships, is uh, just having a meeting about what everybody's understanding an influencer is. And then asking them, you know, within your team, like, who are you following? And then why are you following them? Right? Because exactly. I, I think that's the next one, right? Is the yeah, it's the, it's the why, right? I I find that there has to be a, an exchange of value. And I, I typically find on social that the value exchange is either in the form of education or entertainment or a combination of both. Mm -hmm. Hence the reason why I follow and connect with that person or 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 that brand. And, you know, I, I, I feel like when dealerships do decide to go down the influencer route, which you should, and me and Melanie right. are all for this, so you guys got to do this. Um, yeah. But, you know, understanding what you're looking to get out of it is super important. You mentioned one word right. that is super big for me right now is engagement. I think too often maybe we'll we'll, we'll set something up with an influencer and we go do something, but we really never had a call to action or anything that we're going right. to track. What right. kind of engagement are you looking for when you partner up with an influencer? So what I would suggest to anyone who is looking to do any form of media is you cannot look at this as a month to month commitment. Yes. You have to look at this long term because ultimately like any marketing strategy, you're not going to be able to pencil ROI after 30 days. You need to you need to look at it as a long term strategy and in terms of what kind of engagement you should be looking for, you want to look at you know, what's happening with your content or with their content when they are referencing your dealership mm -hmm. and how many leads and leads I define as direct messages, you know, specifically to that influencer or back to your dealership are coming as a result 
of that particular mention. And then from there, to take it a step further, how many appointments are you setting from that? And then how many people are showing up? And then from there, how many cars did you sell or, or service did you provide for those customers? And, and, and look, for any dealerships or management out there that's watching and listening right now, these are all trackable elements. You know, uh, influencer marketing is not a a, a, a blindfold uh, a spray and pray method. It, it isn't. You you can get very, very targeted. And there yeah. are great measurable KPIs to ensure that you're actually getting your return on your investment. I had to say return on investment because I try to limit the amount of three-letter acronyms we I use. But it's so <laughs> hard in our business. We use them all the bloody time. <laughs> That's true. But it, it, going kind of, uh, you know, with the topic of influencers and kind of going into this next topic, which I think is great. There are ways to actually create influencers within your own dealership. Yes. You know, and I think, so that's a great segue, right? We talked about the importance of influencers. Now let's kind of talk about how as a dealership, you can create your own influencers. You know, uh, let's discuss a little bit about social media and dealership staff and kind of the do's and don'ts of how we can create organic efforts. Yes. This is my favorite topic. <laughs> Um, so for your listeners, Jason, and when Jason and I connected last year, we talked a little bit about this, mm -hmm. um, but just as a refresh, when I was with the auto group, um, previously, there was a project that I was working on with all the sales executives, um, and business managers, anyone who was really customer facing on the sales side. And the project was to create a branding strategy for all of them. So I did little mini workshops for all the salespeople and worked with them to create their own brands. Awesome. And so what I have found is that the two reasons why your team is not posting on social or um, haven't begun this journey yet is for two reasons. So the first reason is fear. Mm -hmm. So they are afraid of what might happen once they start posting. They're afraid of looking foolish. They may be afraid of losing their position, et cetera. And the second reason is they just don't know how, and they need someone to show them how to do it because they don't know how. And with that being said, there are so many ways that you can empower your team to post on social media where it will also benefit the dealership, especially when you are investing in marketing and advertising dollars, specifically within social channels. Mm -hmm. And it will just help elevate the dealership and the stores once you start doing that. No, and it, it's a commitment. You know, I think anybody out there that's, you know, thinking about social media and their dealership staff that it, it's a process, all right? Mm -hmm. um, it's very much so a field of dreams. It's a build it and they will come type scenario. Um, mm -hmm. But but I think I think once you accept the fact that this is a it, this is a process, you know, you're not expecting those results right out right out of the gate. And right. you know, it, it's for me, and I'm 100 with you. You know, you get, you got to get your deal. You got to get your staff to be comfortable with the with being uncomfortable, right? right. We we're talking a little bit about fear. Right? right. And and really when we kind of dissect, like, what is that fear? It's that fear of being kind of uncomfortable or even being exposed, you know, and that's why I could look, it, it's, it's a conversation that has to happen, you know, right. but it, you know, it can be an open conversation and you guys can collectively work together to create a strategy like that. But it, you know, we've talked about this before. You just got to start doing. Yeah, definitely. And I think that every single dealership, is going to have a different mindset with regard mm -hmm. to this. And there are some things that you can do as a business to help protect yourself and your employees in the case that you are concerned for, you know, some situation that might pop up. Right. So one thing that I suggest to any business owner is to have some sort of a, um, a social media waiver that they have their employees sign. Mm -hmm. So the employees understand what it is that they're doing with social media and that they won't put the dealership or themselves in a situation that could be uh, potentially defamatory. So that's straight out of the gate. You know, you've got that understood. Um, the second thing with regard to social content that I would strongly re recommend um, that we did at the dealer group that I was with is to have a social media waiver for your guests 
when they are having photos or videos taken um, in the dealership at time of delivery in the service department, um, you know, leaving a review, whatever the case is, um, that they are signing off saying that they are giving you full permission to utilize their likeness slash image um, for social purposes. Well, that's a great best practice. It, it really is. I mean, again, the, you know, social media and being social. Well, let's talk a little bit more about that. We'll go in that. But because <laughs> I think it's an industry, we actually have no problem embracing the media side of it, right? Like, oh, well, we'll take pictures of happy customers and we'll post videos of them buying cars and we'll post pictures and videos of the cars coming off the ramps and stuff like that. But, you know, having a process thing is great and it has to be documented and getting there and getting everyone's on board. That's a great way to get everybody on board right out of the gate from the moment you show up. As far as employment goes, you're like, here's kind of like the expectation. We are going to be a social dealership. Right. But absolutely. Social being the key word. <laughs> <laughs> so my question for you, Melanie, is I'd love to kind of get your thoughts on how as an industry, can we bring kind of the social back into social media when it comes to our efforts? Because in industry, we're pretty good about focusing on the media part, but I feel yeah. like we fall short a little bit on the social part. I think educating is the way that the industry will shift from being social to being social on social. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> um, I think that just educating and giving your team the tools that they need um, if they do want to put themselves out there and, and understand that there are a lot of people in this world that have no intention of creating a social audience for themselves, number one, or creating a brand for themselves. Mm -hmm. And I look at social media with salespeople the same way that I would look at them sending emails or utilizing their CRM. It's just part of the process now. And the individuals who leverage those processes and those tools are gonna end up ultimately earning more because they're leveraging technology and, and how consumers are shopping today versus not necessarily leveraging those tools that are available. And the reviews is a big one. Yes. Right. So I know that there are some sales consultants in our industry that are con constantly getting reviews written about them. And then they're able to take those reviews and they're able to create multiple forms of content for themselves or the dealership can take those reviews and create multiple forms of content for the dealership. And those are the people who get the phone calls of random people who are asking for them who they don't know because they read the reviews online mm -hmm. and, and social media, you know, being, the different platforms like Facebook and LinkedIn and Instagram and Twitter and TikTok, et cetera. Those are the tools now that salespeople have available to them. So why wouldn't you try to leverage it um, to help, you know, not only increase awareness for your business, increase awareness for your brand and to help sell more cars and make more money. Well, that's actually a really good point. I love the fact that you bring up, you know, awareness because that, that is such an important strategy and part of, you know, our, our organic efforts. Um, but, but, you know, there are multiple strategies that we kind of execute here socially. You know, uh, awareness is key, and I, th that's a great idea to generate more awareness. Um, but I think they have to, we also have to kind of look at strategies that have like real hard call to actions. You know, right. uh, you know, putting con content's king. Content's king right now more than it ever actually has been, just, you know, with the big changes that we have in, in paid efforts and who we can and cannot target and how long we can target them. The content we're putting out there is just going to be more and more important over the next five to ten years and, and probably just even more so as we, we deal with the meta. Um, God, what a horrible name, huh? Anyways, I guys. I know. It sounds <laughs> like a future city on another planet. <laughs> right? <laughs> That's my take on it. It's I'm, very I'm, I'm with you. I was like, I know we're totally going squirrel here, and it happens sometimes on the podcast. But it like, definitely really? sounds like it should be, um, uh, you know, <laughs> it's like a sequel to a sci-fi movie. Right? Exactly. I'm like, okay, cool. But but diving a little more to content strategies. So I love the awareness content strategy, but I think there are content that we put out there that have that have real call to actions. Uh, you right. know, because the, the the intent is to engage with them. So what are right. what, what's some examples? I know you've probably seen some great examples of some of the best you know content ideas or strategies you've seen executed right so my number one go-to type of content that's out there is educational content because for me social media is about access and and it's also about education mm -hmm. and for the purpose of building a brand for yourself 
I believe that educational content on the products that you sell is really important. And that's how you build trust and authority in your space. So for a sales consultant or business manager, educating in your videos or posts about specific topics and the, the CTA or call to action is questions that you can ask, um, including letting people know, you know, that you are available to work with them. That's great. I mean, look, we're talking about creating a brand of, you know, here's the knowledge I have, but here I'm, I'm real also very much so open and having that conversation with you. Right. Right. So there was a saleswoman that I worked with previously and she did such a good job every single time a lead came in for a particular car. Now, again, this was before some of the inventory struggles that we're having today, but <laughs> every time a lead would come in, she would run to the lot. She would find that car and she would do a walk around. She would do a personalized video and send it back to that customer. That's and awesome. I, it's amazing. And everybody loved her. And she just did such a great job in building her brand one-on-one -on -one with the potential customers. And she had a really high closing ratio as well. And I believe it had to do with that interaction that she had with video with the customer on that particular VIN. Oh, yeah. But but you can transfer that to a larger network, right? You can put out information about the dealership. You can put out information about the cars, events, processes, day in the life. And you can do this across every single channel. Mm -hmm. There's a dealership that's in Pennsylvania who does a really, really great job. They're called Bob Ruth Ford. They do such a great job with their TikTok and they have a lot of fun they with do. their TikToks that they do, but they're also educating their customers on the dealership staff, the processes, the product, et cetera. So you can really teach and build the authority in your space. In, in, in our case, it's your PMA or you know your market, but there are so many things that you can do with content that will help grow your brand, not just for the store, but also for the sales consultant. Yeah. Yeah. And speaking of you know, Bob, that's a great example, by the way, if anybody that's watching and listening, you gotta go check out their accounts. Um, yeah. I, I find they do this thing I call edutainment. Yeah, where it's exactly. like they're, they're educating and entertaining you all at the same time. Yes. And if you ever get to a place where you're able to consistently execute on that, you're going to see some amazing results. And it's, I think one of the biggest reasons they've seen amazing results because yeah, I'm and learning and honest, being entertained. Yeah. And TikTok <laughs> is a great place for that. 100%. For that edutainment. And um, BMW, their channel is actually quite good as well. So they have a lot of that. And I think you can gain a lot of inspiration from following some of the factory TikTok channels channels yes. that you can then take that content and recreate it for your brand, for your store and your market. And it's a great source of inspiration. No, it's cool. And I love it. Actually, BMW is a great OEM because when you start thinking of all of them, I, people are always asking me for examples, but you're right. Mm -hmm. I mean, as, as far as at that level, I think they're probably one of the best ones out there right now. But yeah. you know, speaking another of- one. Yeah, oh, go, sorry. No, go ahead. No, go ahead. What's another one? Let's, what's, There's another, another one? great um, dealership in, that's based out of New Jersey here in the US called Circle BMW. Okay. And so they had this one video go viral of just unwrapping the plastic on the car when it came in. Because it's so and satisfying. And it's just like one of those things that people like to watch, like pouring a cup of coffee. It's just aesthetically pleasing and people are interested in watching it. And that's an example of something that you can do on TikTok. You could do it on other platforms. People are really interested in learning about the car business. Well, yeah, actually, I think that's a great example. I mean, yeah. if, if I told you 10 years ago that unboxing products was going right. to represent a 200 plus million dollar a year business, you'd, right. you'd be like, are you, are you effing crazy? Are you like, I know, it's but, wild. But it, it is. Really Those is. accounts, that's what People they're generating. Like, it. like, it's insane. Just, just I like unboxed. watching unboxing. I like seeing all the bags that people buy and they unbox them. And, you know, and, and there's a huge market for that. And why not dealerships too? Why can't dealerships leverage that? They can. Just no one's doing it. 100%. 100%. I'm just trying to think back when I had my dealership, all of the plastic we just peeled off and yeah, never I saw, I never saw social con. I never saw social value in that, but Hey, you yeah. never know unless you try People are into it. It's satisfying to watch <laughs> it. <laughs> now you had mentioned a little earlier, we were kind of talking a little bit about, you know, the shortage, the inventory shortage. So yeah. things that are going on right now, like, like we, 
our industry is in a weird place right now. I, I got to be honest with you. I've been doing a lot of dealer visits recently, and I feel like we've fallen back into some pretty bad practices. You know, it's, it's you know, when things are too easy, I find sometimes complacency kind of kicks in. You know, yeah. not everybody, not everybody, but, you know, yeah. definitely a good percentage of, you know, the dealerships that I've been visiting recently. So I, did, I wanted to talk about this, kind of kicking it back to basics with marketing budgets and strategies. All mm -hmm. right. I, I don't want to lose out on the fundamentals, but I'd love to kind of get your thoughts on how we can kind of get back to the basics. Absolutely. So putting myself back in the shoes of VP of marketing, where I was managing a budget every month and was responsible <laughs> for overseeing co-op and all of that fun stuff that we have the pleasure of experiencing in that role. I think a lot about what I would be doing right now. And, and the truth is, is that it would come down to how efficiently am I spending my dollars and, and how am I maximizing the vendor partnerships that I have mm -hmm. and, and, and maximizing the interactions and just more educational, you know, how do I then take what I'm learning and, and use that towards the dealership? So as you know, there has been the inventory issues that have yep. gone on. Right. <laughs> and so I've seen a lot of, um, anger <laughs> and, um, angst against dealerships. Lots of four letter words. Yeah. Lots of four letter <laughs> words. And so just thinking with my marketing hat on, I would strongly make sure that your process is internally for your re reviews and how you are handling those customer interactions should be on the forefront of the marketing strategy. Um, I, just, I just know from previous experience, people are more inclined to do a rant specifically on a post or social media or to write a negative review, especially if they had a bad experience. Like, so for example, if they put a deposit on a car and then the car was sold to someone else <laughs> that might be able, you know, that could create a situation that could get back to the manufacturer. So just be mindful of the customer interactions that you are having and leverage those interactions for content creation and utilize that in your marketing efforts. The second thing that I would really be focusing on right now, if I was in the dealership working is the community involvement, yeah. because ultimately at the end of the day, some of the things that have happened with the inventory constraints uh, will have a long-term effect on our industry's reputation. And so I would be very, very cognizant of what, people in the community are saying. So I would stay very much involved. If I'm not doing as much advertising, I would be focusing more on different groups within the community that I could be focusing on and working with and getting Great my strategy. name out in that way as well. Yeah, no, look, I, I don't think you stop. And unfortunately I'm seeing a lot of that right now where people are just like, right. let's turn off the tap, you know, right. but that's not, 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 not honestly a strategy. That's just kind of a cop out. You know, I think, because there's less money to be spent doesn't mean that you stop. That just means right. that it's big. It's a bigger challenge. I mean, right. I, you, know, you know, here in Canada, I've always had to struggle with doing as much as possible with very little budgets. You know, we work with a lot of little right. dealerships, you right. know, but, but that's what we're talking about here. Look, you, it's not that you don't have any money. The money's right. there. All right. You just got to get really really serious about targeting those right people and creating right. those strategies and, right. and not just running the one, but I love the fact you mentioned multiple, like it's not just an awareness. It's not just a hard call to action or an acquisition or an existing customer strategy, but it's also community strategy. And yeah. if you're ever going to run one, this is a great time to do so. Right. I agree a hundred percent. And I think that it's very, very important that you put yourself in the position of the customer right now, yes. because I know that, many dealerships have stopped advertising um, due to budget and just not needing to advertise, right? So most manufacturers will reimburse you if you have co-op available and every factory is different with how they distribute co-op and how it works and so on and so forth. But doing an event at the dealership um, or somewhere else, typically they will reimburse you for it. So it's just another way to continue marketing and advertising in more of a grassroots way. But 
what I like to remind my clients is if you completely shut everything off and Jason, I'm sure you have this conversation as well. All the time. Eventually you're going to lose market share exactly. because one day this whole thing is going to get turned back around and it will be business as usual. And you don't want to completely damage your reputation in the process. And that's why being on top of your reviews, utilizing those reviews for content and being involved with the community and having events where you're putting the dealership in a good light are really important right now. It, it is. And it really kind of comes down to, you know, how you're perceived as a brand, you know, is how right. well you execute what Melanie just listed out. Speaking of brand, I know we're getting toward the tail end, but I want to sneak this one in before, before you have to go. Uh, let's talk a little bit about building a, a personal brand. Sure. Um, Cause I think you've done a phenomenal job of it. And yeah. you know, it's, I know it's through trial and error. Like I just, I know personally, I know it is too. Right. So I'd love to kind of get your thoughts on building a personal brand and how that's kind of gone for you and what you've kind of learned through your process. Yeah, sure. It's been quite the journey. So I started posting, as I mentioned earlier, um, on LinkedIn as my social channel of choice. And the reason I chose LinkedIn is because I saw a massive opportunity where decision makers were globally, not just um, people who you couldn't identify who they were. You would actually be able to see who they are, you know, what they do, their job experience, et cetera. So I started posting on LinkedIn last January and I had just under 3000 connections slash followers. So today I have over 90,000 followers on LinkedIn and the journey has been a combination of you no, know, really hard work. You say try and error. I say trial and terror yeah. <laughs> because there have been so many things that I have learned in the process of building out my personal brand. But the one piece of advice that I would give anyone, um, and I've spoken, you know, whether it's at a business or I actually spoke at a school a couple of weeks ago, I talked to my clients about this is no matter what you're doing, don't limit yourself to only one area. Mm -hmm. And the reason that I say that is because we saw last month, Facebook, WhatsApp, and Instagram completely went off, right? Yep. And there are so many people who look to those channels for inbound leads. And it's great to have a presence on those channels, but it's also great to have a presence within the Google search engine sure. and to have a presence on a professional network like LinkedIn. And I personally leverage LinkedIn more than the other platforms due to the simple fact that to me, I do not want to waste my time with building out content and creating a following if it's not necessarily going to convert because the people aren't real. Exactly. Does that make sense? No, no, no. It, it's where your audience is. It's hundred percent makes Correct. sense. Correct. And it is also audience based, right? So there are some, like that dealership I had mentioned, Circle BMW, they have a great following on Instagram. They have a great following on TikTok, but their following is larger on certain platforms. So I have a following on Twitter, but my following is much larger on LinkedIn. And I have worked very hard to make sure that everything that I'm doing is coming up with, you know, offsite SEO purposes. Mm -hmm. So that's another area where if you're doing media, if you're going on podcasts, if you're in articles, if you know, you're being awarded with something, just make sure that when you are doing this, that you have it everywhere. And, and that would be the advice that I would give to a business owner as well um, for their business is just, just make sure that when things are happening, if a, if um, a local news channel comes to your dealership because you're doing an event towards the holidays um, make sure that you get a clip of that. Yes. Put that on your website. Make sure it's on your social channels. Share it with your employees. Get them to share it. Run a contest. You know, okay. get it out there so people understand that you know you're doing all these things and connect the dots that way. And I would say that that's an area that I see the biggest of, of opportunities is most people just aren't connecting those dots, not because they don't want to, but just because they don't know how to. No, I, I think that's totally true. You know, I mean, look, it, it is a journey. And thank you for sharing with that, by, by the way. Yeah. I think sometimes want to hold, people want to hold on to it and they don't want to be totally yeah. open about it. Like, oh, it's my secret sauce. Eh, it's just, no, it's listen. Secret sauce. It's just good old-fashioned hard work. <laughs> listen, I share my recipes because I know at the end of the right? day, Jason, 
I'm the only one that can cook it the way that I know how to do it. And no one else can, in my opinion. So that's why I'm happy to share. I feel like if it will help someone, no matter where they are, I'm happy to help them. (laughs) We're so similar like that. We love doing it, right? It's fun. Yeah. And we're getting towards the tail end of our time. We've covered some pretty amazing topics. Um, I still think that there's some more conversations to be had there. For anybody out there that's watching and listening right now and would love to connect with you, maybe even continue some of these conversations, what's what's the best way to do so okay so my website melanie borden llc.com is a great way to connect with me and to learn more about me Um, you can also come connect with me on linkedin to search melanie borden Um, on instagram obviously i'm not as a much of an instagram user as i am a linkedin user (laughs) um, but melanie borden llc and then on twitter and borden llc awesome Hey, Melanie, thank you so much for taking the time to jam with me today. This has been a lot of fun. You have yourself an amazing day. Thank you too, Jason. Thanks for tuning in to the Strategy with Jason podcast with your host, Jason Harris. Don't want to miss new content? Be sure to check out the full podcast library at strategywithjason.com to stay in the know. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe. Happy podcasting.